Okay, so I guess why don't we go ahead and uh, get started on this. So, um, yeah, so uh, today sort of the, the plan is to kind of start talking about, so up to this point on these streams, we've talked about systems that we can solve exactly, right? So very, very simple systems, and that's sort of the issue with doing that. Um, the systems that we can solve exactly, yeah, it's great that we can do it, uh, and they serve as great examples of the, um, of the physics, but in reality they tend to be almost too simple, to the point where they're almost boring, um, and not, not necessarily physical either. And as it turns out, as we'll see very shortly, even some physical systems, uh, it is very, very difficult to solve um, for the um, solve for the dynamics or solve the equations governing the physics to solve it exactly. Um, and so, so hopefully today, uh, talk about how, what how to approach that issue. Uh, and so. As we'll see, to do that, we have to resort to some way of approximating the system. If we can't solve it exactly, we'll solve it pretty close. Um, and so uh, what we'll use today is something known as a Taylor series. If you've taken calculus class, I'm sure you've seen this uh, before. Uh, if not, then uh, we'll go over sort of the mathematics behind a Taylor series, and then we'll look at how to apply them in both math and physics, uh, and use them both to solve systems we might not be able to otherwise, but also uh, to uncover some relationships that might be unexpected uh, or some, some deep connections. Um, so yeah, uh, let's go ahead and get going. Uh, and of course, as always, if you have any questions, Feel free to leave them in the chat. Always uh, looking at it. Um, let's let's go ahead and do this. So, the the very first thing uh, that I want to talk about uh, is a pendulum, right? Very very simple system, and we'll even take a very idealized pendulum, right? So we'll go ahead and say it's hanging uh, some mass. Call it mass m. And we'll say it's hanging from a rigid rod of length L. And we'll even say that uh, this rod is completely massless. So um, I'll just write this down. So rod is rigid and massless. Um, and it has length L. So um, we'll just, uh, sort of parameterize the motion of this, uh, pendulum by some angle it is with the vertical, call it theta. Now, since the rod is, uh, rigid, we know that this, uh, this mass can't move inwards and outwards, so it's always going to be restricted to move along some part of a circle. It might not go all the way around the circle. But some, some piece of the circle this has to be restricted to. So um, it's probably a good idea to use some of the concepts that we've talked about for uh, rotating objects. Um, but first, we need to ask ourselves, well, what, what forces are acting on this? Well, there's only one. Well, there's, there's multiple forces. But the, the force that we really care about, if we're using rotating um, uh, the principles from rotating uh, objects, and that's gravity, which is going to act downwards with a uh, force of mg. Now there's there's forces acting along this rod, there's tension and all this stuff, but since it's acting in the radial direction, we don't actually care about it. What we're going to look at is the torque, um, and we know that the torque is the uh, distance to the mass that we care about, crossed with the force that's acting on it. Uh, and since any, any forces acting 
along this rod are going to be parallel to this uh, radius vector, then the torques are all going to drop out. Okay, so this is this is great. Uh, it's a great start. So why don't we, uh, instead of looking at the full torque, just just look at the magnitude of it. That that that'll be a good start for us. So the magnitude of the torque in this case. Well, we know that this is given by the moment of inertia, moment of inertia, times the angular acceleration. Well, the moment of inertia for a for a mass, we'll assume that this is a point mass. It's not some crazy weird distribution of mass. Just just assume it's a point mass. So that's um, so I is going to be equal to m times l squared, and alpha is just how uh it's it's our analog to uh acceleration but for angles so it, it's you can think about it, uh this is sort of the how much theta is accelerating not not really accelerating but it's it's the analog so we can write that out as um just m l squared d e two theta dt squared, and we know that this is going to be equal to the magnitude of r cross f. What is the magnitude of r cross f? Well, we know that the magnitude of a cross product of vectors is just the, magni uh, the magnitude of each of the vectors uh, times the sine of the angle uh, between them, right? So in, in this case, this just gives us L, because L is always going to be the magnitude of this distance vector. Um, we get minus mg, because the force is acting downwards, and then we get sine theta. Yes. So what we actually want to solve is this equation here, 2 theta dt squared is equal to minus mgl sine theta. Now we'll just shuffle everything around, because remember we want to figure out how theta changes with time. We want to solve for theta, that's the thing that we care about. So let's just shuffle everything around, and we find an equation like this. Minus g over l sine Theta. I'll go ahead and put this in a box. Okay, so this is where we sort of hit our sticking point. Um, this may look like a very simple equation, but uh, this is uh, actually known as a, a transcendental, if I can spell, transcendental equation. I think I spelled that correctly. Sure. Um, basically, uh, the the idea being, if I have a uh, function, so in this case theta, which is written in terms of um, well, theta itself is written, or theta's derivatives are written uh, in terms of sines, cosines, logarithms, exponentials of itself. Uh, so, for example, I might have something like f of t is equal to log of f of t. Something like this uh, is, is typically very difficult to solve, uh, and oftentimes actually impossible to solve. Um, in, in this case, I, I think this equation is technically solvable, but it is very, very difficult. So... What do we do? I this is this is about oh, as simple as it gets, right? It's a it's an idealized pendulum on a massless rod uh, that's totally rigid. So so this sucks that we can't even solve this equation. Well, why don't we try? But try in a different way. Try to get close to the right solution. And to do that, we're going to use as I said before uh, these Taylor series expansions. 
So what, what is this ta Taylor series expansion? Okay, so something that uh, we'll start with is just say I, I have some function uh, f of x, which can be differentiated uh, n times. So I, I can take n derivatives uh, of this. Oops. Differentiated n times. Uh, and I'll, I'll just, I'll just sort of for ease of notation, uh, I'll write a derivative, so d m f d t m. So this would be the mth derivative. Uh, I'll just, um, and actually evaluate it at t. I'll just call this uh, with a little superscript. That'll, that just denotes the m, I'm taking the mth derivative of this. Okay, so when I say that uh, f can be differentiated n times, this is really, you know, in some, in some range I can differentiate it. It's regular, all, all this good stuff, um, if you want to be super formal about it. Um, but let's just worry, we can take these derivatives. And that tells us that we can, of course, undo these derivatives by taking integrals. So, for example, if I take the nth derivative, so uh, uh, fn of x, call it x1 here, just as a dummy variable, and I'm going to integrate that to some uh, between some number, I'll call x0, and some upper bound, which I'll call x. So when I do this, I undo one of my derivatives, and then I, I evaluate that function at each of the bounds. So uh, in our notation here, this is just f of n minus uh, f to the n minus one because I undid one of my derivatives, and then that's evaluated at x minus f n minus one, evaluated at whatever this constant lower bound is. Okay, so, so now let's treat x as a parameter which can vary. So we'll, uh, we'll, we can play around with x, but we'll fix x0. So in this case, um, why don't I just integrate again? And actually this time I'll rename this to x2. How about? So this case, I can integrate from x0 we'll say to x3, the x2, x0 to x2, the x1, fn, x1. So we're just taking what we did here and integrating that. So um, I'll just, I'll write it out a little more explicitly. x3, the x2, fn minus 1 x2 minus integral like this. Okay. So now this integral hits this function. Um, the, so, so the integral over x2 hits this function, and it's going to undo one of our derivatives again. Right, because this is a function evaluated at x2, which is the variable that we're integrating over. Ah, sorry, I actually made a typo here. The x2, sorry. Now, in the second integral, nothing here depends on x2, right? We've fixed this lower bound uh, at x0, so nothing here actually depends on x2, so this might as well just be a constant. So we'll just get some... Uh, some x, some, as if we're integrating a constant. So writing that a little more explicitly, so this first term, I'm going to undo another one of my derivatives, so that becomes n minus 2. And then I'm going to evaluate the, uh, the first one at x3, minus n minus 2, evaluated at x0, and then minus x3 minus x0 
times fn minus 1 x naught. Okay, so now we can continue. We can keep doing this. So if we do this again, uh, just to try to get uh, this pattern down, so there there is a there is a very uh, distinct pattern that shows up. But just to make sure that we see it, uh, why don't we just integrate again? Integrate this time over x three. It's not x two, x one, f n x one. And this time we're going to see something very similar happen, right? So here we integrate this one. We undo one of our integrals. So this is n minus 3, x4, right? Because that's our last integral that we're doing. It's 4, minus fn minus 3, x naught. So that these two terms just come from integrating this first term over x3. Now this term is again going to just be our constant. So I'll write this on the next line. And this just becomes x4 minus x naught times fn minus uh, 2 x evaluated at x naught. And this one, the only piece that, uh, so the, this last term, the only piece that depends on x3, which is what we're integrating over in the last integral is this first piece here. But this is just a polynomial, so we know that we raise uh, the power by 1 and divide by the new power. And when we do that, um, we get something like, like x4 minus x0 squared over 2 f n minus 1 x0. Okay, so ho hopefully we're starting starting to see the pattern where um, basically every time we integrate, we get the uh, the upper bound of our final integral plugged into uh, some function with fewer derivatives acting on it, and then we get the same function but evaluated at the lower bound at this x naught that we fixed. And then each subsequent term, we get more and more powers of this difference here. It's x4 minus x0. But remember, each time we integrate, we're going to end up dividing by the new power that we get. So if we were to integrate over x4, in this last term we'd get a cube here. But we would also get something like um, 2 times 3 in the denominator. And then we do it again, and we get something times 4, where uh, we would get a 4, uh, something raised to the fourth power. So if I just keep uh, doing this over and over and over again, uh, I can write this out as uh, something like x naught n. I'll say dx n. So I integrate n times. So I undo all of the derivatives that I've done on this uh, function. Uh, so I'll say integral x0 to xn dx n minus 1, and I just keep integrating until I get down 0 to x3 dx2 ah, x0 x2 dx1 fn x1. So the idea is I undo all of the derivatives that I've done. I do n derivatives here, and so I integrate n times. And what I end up with is something like f of x, so just my function evaluated at this final upper bound, minus f x0, minus x minus x naught, right? This is where we start getting these polynomials, uh, times the first derivative, evaluated at x0, and then I just keep going, uh, x minus x naught squared over 2, uh, second derivative, x naught. And then this keeps going, continues, and I'll get something like x minus x naught to the n minus 2 over n minus 2 factorial. 
write this factorial, basically I have a factorial, this is a times a minus one times a minus two, all the way down to one. Um, and this just comes from this fact of what I was saying before, is each time we raise the power in the numerator, we have to also divide that by that power when we take the integral. So that's where this factorial is coming from. Uh, this is the n minus derivative, not. And then I get the final term, which is x minus x naught. Oh, should be n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial f n minus 1 x naught. Which I can write all of this right hand side as just a sum. So uh, this right hand side here I can condense very nicely. Oops, not an equals sign, minus sum from m equals 0, n minus 1, x minus x naught to the m divided by m factorial, f m evaluated at x naught. Okay, so now all I have to do is solve for f of x, and then I have my function as a sum like this. Um, and so that's fairly straightforward to do. I'll just write this as this sum, m equals 0 to n minus 1, x minus x naught to the m, m factorial, f m x naught, plus some, some junk. <laughs> which I'll call rn x x naught. It depends on both of these. Where this junk is essentially just this whole integral here. n x x naught. That's what I'm calling. Okay, so now we have a realization that if, I'll write this out, if x minus x naught is small, um, and all of my derivatives are well behaved, uh, I'll just say all, ber all of my derivatives don't blow up. So none of these none of these derivatives get exceptionally huge. Then each term oops, each term gets smaller and smaller. Smaller and smaller. Um, and we can see this because if I if I raise some small number to the power uh, some higher power that's an even smaller number right i mean if i have um uh, i i suppose i should say if x minus x naught is less than really we'll say much less than one uh, you can think about it as if i have one over one tenth right a pretty small number um if i square that i get something which is one over 100 an even smaller number now if I cube it, that's 1 over 1,000, an even smaller number, and so on and so forth. Um, and so each one of these contributions, again, as long as these derivatives don't blow up, uh, gets uh, successively smaller and smaller. Which means that if I want a pretty decent approximation, I can just sort of ignore these remainder terms, right? The, this remainder is going to include any, any higher order uh, terms that I've neglected in this sum. Um, I, I can just sort of forget about them. Now, of, of course, there's going to be cases where this doesn't necessarily work, and I can't necessarily uh, get rid of these, but as long as I'm uh, looking at x is pretty close to x naught, I can just forget about this remainder. Uh, and so I can approximate my function as just this sum. 
And um, the higher n I go to in this sum, the better the approximation gets. It, it, as right because uh, as I keep going and adding my uh, smaller and smaller contributions, this here be, is going to become even smaller and even smaller um, until uh, I essentially get to zero when I take this sum all the way to infinity. Okay? Um, yeah, so, so that's the math idea behind this. So uh, I want to take a quick second to pause, see if people have any questions that I can address. Um, and, and then we'll get into actually doing some physics. Draw a box around this. Okay, not really seeing any questions showing up. Oh, here we go. Why the remainder all? Yeah, so, okay, so the question is, uh, didn't quite catch why the remainder is small um, if x minus x naught is small. And basically the idea being, okay, this is in principle a whole bunch of integrals that I have to... Um, that I have to do, and yeah, you're you're exactly right. Um, in principle, you should always find this remainder. You should always um, look at this remainder and make sure that it is small. But the the idea is that if my function is uh, nicely behaved in this region that I care about, um, then all of uh, so here I'll, I'll, I'll write it out. Um, this function is going to end up, I can, I can keep doing this. I can keep taking derivatives. I can keep integrating all of those derivatives up. Uh, and eventually I'll get something uh, where this sum goes all the way to infinity. M factorial. And this is going to hold exactly. Again, Assuming everything, my function is well behaved enough in this region, um, and all of that. Uh, so, basically the idea is that um, when I cut off this sum, all of the rest of the terms that are in this sum here, right, so from n to all the way up to infinity, that's what's going to live in this r. Yes, it's in principle a bunch of integrals, but if I can do these integrals, I, I can, uh, again, in the same way, write it as a sum like this. Um, and so just by this same argument of, you know, as long as this is small, each of these terms is going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and so once I cut it off, uh, this remainder should usually be smaller than any of the contributing terms in here. Again, in principle, it's, it's probably better practice to check uh, and make sure that your function is suitably well behaved in that region and all of that, but that's, that's the idea behind it. Hopefully, hopefully that answered the question. And, uh, of course, you, you could probably get very deep into the math uh, behind why this is, um, but that's uh, sort of the beside the focus. Um, I, uh, so hopefully that's satisfactory enough for you.
Okay, so, so let's go ahead and try to actually do something with this. Um, so we, we had our problem of our pendulum, right? Our, our pendulum was, uh, I'll rewrite the differential equation here. Uh, we had this nasty transcendental equation, which uh, we don't know how to solve. And the problem is this. The problem is this guy here, this sine of theta. So um, let's try to use this approximation technique uh, and look at where theta is small. Uh, so we'll look, um, going back up to our picture, where theta is small, meaning that we don't drop this pendulum from too high, right? So it might go very, very close to being totally vertical. Um, and we'll just, we'll look at it there so that we can use this approximation. So when we do that, we want to find derivatives. Um, so that, that vertical is going to be at uh, theta equals zero. So in this case, that's going to be what we're going to use for this x naught. Um, so, okay, so all we have to do is find these derivatives and evaluate them at theta equals zero. So uh, our f zero evaluated at zero, right, where f of theta is we're just going to call sine theta. F0, so the zeroth derivative, which is just sine theta, evaluated at zero, is zero. The first derivative of sine of theta is going to be cosine. So this is cosine of zero, which gives me one. I can, of course, keep going, and I can write the second derivative at zero is minus sine uh, at zero, which is again zero. Uh, the third derivative at zero is equal to minus cosine, and that's minus one. So it, you see that uh, all of the even derivatives that I take, those are always going to give me zero, because it's always going to be a sine. Um, these uh, trig functions always alternate back and forth between sine and cosine and sine and cosine. So every even derivative, I get a sine, which when I evaluate that at zero, gives me zero. Uh, every odd derivative gives me a cosine, which gives me one, but the sine switches. Okay? So I can write some approximation to this as this is going to be um, actually, I'll write it just to sort of give another little bit of notation. Theta cubed over 3 factorial. Right, the theta here coming from this first derivative, and the theta cubed coming from the third derivative being minus 1, hence the minus here. Uh, and so this isn't an exact equality, but there are extra terms, which I'll just say, um, I'll write in this notation of O theta to the fifth, meaning that everything higher order than theta cubed, so all terms which are theta to the fifth and higher order, um, order just mean, meaning what power lives here, um, that lives in this O function. Okay? So if I want to solve this, I can, I can even get a very crude approximation by just taking this very first term here. So uh, when I do that, this is equal to minus g over l theta of t. Um, and actually, I should write this as an approximation. But we know that this is just a harmonic oscillator, right? Harmonic oscillator. We've seen this differential equation before, where the second derivative is proportional to minus the first derivative. Um, and so this is uh, 
I can just, you know, write this as, depending on whatever my uh, boundary conditions are, omega t plus b sine omega t, uh, where omega here is square root of g over l. So this is the frequency that uh, this thing is going to oscillate back and forth with. And a and b are numbers that I fix with uh, initial conditions or boundary conditions, whatever. Okay, so so we have an approximate solution, and I mean it makes sense, right? So um, all this is telling me is that you know when I when I drop a pendulum, it's going to oscillate. No big surprise there, but we've taken something that we originally thought was unsolvable and got an approximate solution, and that approximate solution give, it makes sense, which is always a good check. Okay, so then I'm sure the question that a lot of people have right now is how how good is this? How, I mean, you know, if it's a really crappy approximation, then who cares about all this? And uh, just to kind of give you an idea, I have um, gone ahead and made a couple of animations. Hopefully, you can see these okay. Um, so, okay, so when we when we're at pretty small angles, right? Uh, in this in this first one, the the blue pendulum is the approximate solution. Uh, so so this is the one just taking the order theta. Uh, and when we have small uh, angles, the red is a numerical solution to the full equation. It does a pretty good job. You can see, yeah, they're different, um, but y you know, for I as long as we don't look at too many oscillations, it does a pretty dang good job. Um, but as we crank up the uh, starting angle, so we'll go something like here. You can see that it starts to do pretty poorly and, and very quickly um, it starts to be very different from the uh, exact numerical solution. Um, so what do we do? Well, something we can do is, well, instead of just looking at this most basic approximation, let's try the next best thing. So include uh going back to it uh let's let's try to include this uh theta cube term as well again our our differential equation it makes the differential equation harder to solve and i'm i'm not going to go through the solution um but it can be done um in principle it's no longer a transcendental equation meaning that it's far simpler to solve uh, that, though it, it, it is still quite difficult. Um, so then I come down here, and in this case the, uh, the approximate solution is green, whereas the um, exact solution is, exact numerical solution is again red. So again, at small angles, very good job. Uh, you can almost not even see the red ball um, as it oscillates because this approximation is so good. Um, and now, if we go up to higher angles, so we'll go to something like this, uh, you can see that even in this case, the, uh, the third order approximation still does a very good job. Um, so, so actually, this uh, approximation, even taken to second uh, or to the second simplest term, uh, does a pretty good job of approximating the actual dynamics of the system. Uh, so that that kind of gives you an idea of how powerful these approximations can actually be when we're presented with a physical system that we might not necessarily know how to solve exactly. Okay. So, again, before I move on, I want to take a quick pause, see if there's any more questions about all this stuff. Um, yeah. We're going to hopefully do one more math thing, uh, and then a couple more physics. Math thing is a, 
uh, if you've if you've seen this conversation about Taylor series, you've probably seen the math thing that I want to do. Uh, might even have an idea of where I'm going with it, but um, it it's a it's a math thing that's used all the time in physics anyway. So so it's a good uh, relationship to show and know where it comes from. But yeah. Okay. Any question? Time? Okay. Well, might as well just go ahead and move on for now oh ah ah yeah so uh the question is uh missed it at the beginning uh why is the equation unsolvable so it uh, this particular one i i don't think is actually unsolvable it's just it's very very difficult to solve and uh it's it's this idea that it's a it's a transcendental equation a fancy math name for it um, basically just meaning that I have some function like a sine or a cosine or a logarithm or an exponential, and that's related to a, the function itself or its derivatives. Um, and so the, the basic idea, and, and this extends to um, um, regular just algebraic relations as well. So um, an example that I gave earlier is if I have f is equal to log of f. Uh, this is actually quite uh, non-trivial to solve, even though it, it looks very simple. Um, just because, you know, in algebra we tend to use all of these inverse functions, so if I have two things added, I can undo that with a, a subtraction. Uh, I can get rid of a multiplication by dividing, so on and so forth, but if I try to do the inverse of this, then I just get something like e to the f is equal to f, and it, it doesn't actually help me, right? I'm, I'm still kind of stuck. Um, so uh, the, this sort of equation is, is, is notoriously a, a, a thorn um, when you're trying to solve uh, either differential equations or just regular algebraic equations. In in general cases, there there are some um, just unsolvable uh, equations that do show up in physics, uh, meaning that the mathematics just doesn't exist to solve the problem. Um, in in fact, of uh, perhaps the most uh, relevant to modern physics is uh, much of quantum field theory is not actually solvable, and so you you do something very similar to this. Uh, where you just take some small number in your theory and you expand uh, in higher and higher orders of that small number. And uh, you just, you take the leading contribution and it tends to do a very, very good job of approximating um, what you can do. And actually, the, uh, this is something that is probably a good thing to talk about. At some point, it, it becomes... Um, the the difference between the exact solution and our approximate solution becomes uh, meaningless to really talk about because if we're trying to compare with experiments, which is always sort of the purpose, we want our physical theories to predict what happens in experiments, um, then the experiment's only going to be able to measure things to so much accuracy. Right, a, a meter stick can only have so many ticks on it. Uh, so, if I can get my approximation to be at least the same uh, accuracy as my um, as my experiment, then 
eh, there might as well not be any difference at all. And so that's sort of the uh, guiding principle in a lot of particle physics is that these uh, these approximate solutions, these uh, as you call it perturbation theory, these perturbative solutions, um, they they give an accurate enough result to be able to compare with experiments. And so that's that's sort of the idea in this. But okay, uh, enough of, enough of that tangent. Let's let's go ahead and uh, prove this math result. It's a very very cool one. Uh, so um, okay, so so as we were seeing, um, we have our sine theta function. We saw that the first term is going to look like theta. Second term is going to be minus theta cubed over three factorial. Right, and we saw before that we're only going to get odd, um, odd derivatives, and they're either going to be one or minus one, depending on, um, and they're going to alternate. So I can keep this going with a plus theta to the fifth over five factorial, minus theta to the seventh over seven factorial, plus dot dot dot, and I, I can keep this going. Um, and I can write this more compactly as a sum from m equals 0 to infinity. Uh, and actually, I'll call this uh, n. n equals 0 to infinity. And theta to the 2n plus 1. 2n plus 1 because I'm only picking out the odd numbers. Divided by... 2n plus 1 factorial. Again, 2n plus 1 just picks out the odd numbers. So uh, in this case, I can re-index my sum. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just define some new index, uh, m, which is equal to 2n plus 1. So if I do this, I'm just going to be summing over all odd values of m, right? So th this just gives me the value in the exponent and down here, uh, and it gives me all of the odd values. Um, I can also solve for n to figure out what the heck to put in here, and this is going to give me something like 1 half m minus 1. And so I can write my sine theta as this infinite sum from m Again, I'm only counting the odd values of m. Minus 1 to the 1 half, m minus 1. Theta to the m divided by m factorial. Now, here's a, here's a little trick. Uh, I can say that this guy is equal to, I'll just rewrite it a little bit more explicitly, minus 1 square root of minus 1, right, from this 1 half, raised to the m minus 1, which is just i to the m minus 1. The minus 1 just means that I have some power, uh, some value in the denominator, so I can again rewrite this as i to the m divided by i, or minus i times i to the m. Now when I do all this rearrangement, uh, I can rewrite this sum as minus i, the minus i just coming from this guy here, times i theta to the m, just pulling this i into this exponent here, uh, divided by m factorial, where now I'm summing over only the odd values of m. Okay, excellent. So that's for sine. Well, we, we also have uh, its partner function, which is cosine, right? Um, I'm going to actually put a box around this real quick just so that we don't lose it. So um, let's again expand uh, cosine of theta around theta equals 0 and see what happens. So uh, I start out with cosine of 0 equals 1. 
I get um call this f zero zero first derivative at zero is going to give me minus sine which is zero the second derivative is going to give me minus cosine and so on uh, so you you see that uh, this is going to be essentially the exact same pattern that I saw for sine but now the powers right the powers and the uh, number of derivatives that I do are always going to be the same um, but when I go from sine to cosine, I shift the powers. So here I only have even powers which survive, whereas with sine I only had odd powers. So I get something like cosine theta is equal to 1 minus theta squared over 2 factorial plus theta the fourth over 4 factorial, and so on. And again, I can write this as some very nice compact sum n equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 the n, um, right, just, this just gives me my alternating sign, uh, and I get theta to the 2n divided by 2n factorial, the 2n now picking up the odd term, or the even term, sorry. Now we'll re-index this again the same way bef as before, except now we'll call m2n. And in this case, I get something. Uh, move this. So re-index so that m is equal to 2n. And so then, of course, n is equal to 1 half m. And you see uh, we get some power, uh, some, so I'll just write it out, be uh, not lazy. With this, uh, this gives me square root minus 1 to the m, which is, of course, just i to the m. So in this case, I get sum over m even now, right? Because m is only going to be even. And this gives me theta, or sorry, i times theta to the um, m over m factorial. So, I, I mean, this, this hopefully isn't too surprising that we found that uh, sine and cosine are very closely related functions. Um, and in fact, we can see that, okay, down here, in the case of cosine, I only have the even functions. Up here, I only have the odd functions. So if I just get rid of this pesky factor of i or of minus i, I can add these together and I get a total sum over all m. Uh, and of course I, I just get rid of this factor of i uh, by multiplying by i. So uh, I can say that cosine uh, cosine theta plus i times sine theta. Right, this i just killing off the i from here. This is equal to the sum from m equals 0 to infinity, so all values of m, i theta to the m over m factorial. Okay, so this is, this is very cool, but we're not done yet. Haven't done the coolest thing yet, which is, uh, now let's consider some other function, some other general exponential. Maybe we just want to get really good at taking these uh, expansions, polynomial expansions. So let's let's look at a different function that shows up quite often in physics, which is uh, an exponential, right? E to the x. Uh, and now let's expand around x equals zero. So if I do that, I'll uh, Call this f of x equals e to the x. So I just do my typical thing, uh, evaluate it at x equals 0, and this gives me 1. And I take the first derivative, well the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and I get 1. And I take the second derivative, and I get 1. And of course so on and so forth because the derivative of e to the x is always going to be e to 
to x. So e to the x is going to be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 2 factorial plus dot 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 which is just equal to n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. And now we say, okay, wait a second, wait a second, wait. This and this look suspiciously similar. Uh, to the point where if I call x i theta, then they're actually exactly the same, right? So I can say that e to the i theta is equal to this sum from n equals 0 to infinity, i theta to the n over n factorial, which is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. And this is, uh, this is actually quite an amazing uh, expression. Uh, if this is your first time seeing this, hopefully, uh, hopefully your mind was just blown. Um, but uh, it, this, is, this is amazing because we find that uh, a complex exponential, so e raised to a imaginary number, is just an oscillating function. It's, uh, it's, if I look at this in the complex plane, right, where I have the real part of this on this axis and the imaginary part of this on this axis, then uh, this, I can, of course, represent this as some uh, arrow in the complex plane. And it turns out this is always going to have magnitude 1, and as I increase theta, I just go around in a circle. So now if I say theta is something like omega t, then this is just going to be a function that goes around this circle um, over and over. So uh, when we say that e to the i theta is an oscillating function or an oscillatory function, this is where that comes from. And this is also where uh, perhaps one of the most... Uh, Arguably the most amazing uh, expression in mathematics comes from as well, which is e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. You can see that uh, if I just plug in theta equals pi here, this gives me minus 1. But, I mean, if you, if you appreciate, let, let's go ahead and appreciate this, and actually I'll just rewrite this. And, um... We can appreciate this as an irrational number, so a number that can't be written as a fraction, raised to an imaginary irrational number, gives me a real integer. So this is, this is an absolutely amazing uh, relation uh, and something that I would hope nobody expects or sees as obvious, um, but so I, it wouldn't be a conversation about uh, Taylor series if I didn't bring up this relation. Okay. So now let's uh, let's go ahead and get back to physics. Um, this is a phys physics channel after all. So I. I if you're in physics, a common joke that you'll hear a lot of times is that, okay, well, I've, every system I care about is a harmonic oscillator. It's always a harmonic oscillator. And yes, while, while that is a joke, um, there, there's a lot of truth to it, and there's a reason it, become, it became such a popular joke. Uh, and we can see it by uh, talking about the potential energy of some system. So say I have a system and I can write down its potential energy. So potential energy energy we'll say is given by u of x. So we know that I can write the force 
on an object uh, in the system as f equals minus gradient of u. Right, where, again, this is just a vector derivative. Um, I can write this in other ways as well. I could call it fi equals minus um, u dxi, call this diu, whatever. Um, okay. So uh, let's uh, get a little bit of a interpretation of what this is telling us. This is saying that if I have some x, u of x, I don't know, it could be some function like this. Say I'm sitting here on this function, so I, I'm, I'm at this value of x, which gives me a value of the potential energy. What this equation is saying is that if I go in x, so I change in x, that's what this derivative is telling me. Um, if I increase uh, my value of u, right, so if I, if I move in the negative x direction, and the value of u increases, this tells me that the direction of f is actually going to be in the positive x direction. So in the opposite direction of uh, that I've moved. That's what this minus sign says. Um, and similarly, if I decrease u, so if I move this way and I decrease u, it also tells me that f is in that direction. So a, a nice sort of picture to have when we talk about potential energy is you can sort of always think about potential energy as a hill. Um, and this, uh, the, the force coming from this potential energy is always going to try to take us to the bottom of the hill, right? Because as soon as we start increasing our potential energy again, we're going to get some force pulling us back down. So that's what this equation tells us. Um, and so sort of immediately we can, we can see this uh, idea of harmonic oscillators, where if I have some minimum here, and I'm, I'm kind of floating around this minimum, might expect to sort of oscillate back and forth around it, right? Because as soon as I pass it, I have the force switches direction and starts pulling me back towards the minimum, and then I pass it again, and so on and so forth. So, um, okay, how do, we, how do we show this mathematically? Well, um, we know that uh, a minimum is given when the derivative, so the slope of our function, remember whenever I say derivative, you should think slope. So the slope of the function is zero. Right, that's sort of one of our definitions of a minimum and a maximum is that the slope vanishes. Uh, so one way I can write that is uh, x evaluated at x equals x naught. So in this case, I'll call the value of this minimum x naught. Uh, that's going to give me zero. Okay. So. Um, but, I mean, this is also true for a maximum, so how do we differentiate between the two? Well, we differentiate between the two by looking at what's happening to the slope as we, as we go. Um, so as we're going this way, you can see that uh, the slope is actually increasing. It's still, it's still going, it's still pointed down, right? The slope is still negative. Um, I'll do this in a different color but it's getting less and less negative until we hit this point. Um, and now it's become positive. So we can see that the slope is now changing in the positive direction, right? Because the slope is increasing. 
well, that's going to correspond to a second derivative. And now, I I could keep doing things in three dimensional notation, but it sort of it sort of obscures the point behind the notation. So let's just work in one dimension for now. So uh, in one dimension, uh, I can rewrite this where I'll just call this prime uh, for differentiation. I know the first derivative is zero, and by this argument. If it's a minimum, I know that the second derivative has to be greater than zero. That's positive. And remember, uh, so if it were a maximum, it would be less than zero for a max. And you can see that here. So a as I'm approaching this maximum, the slope gets more and more negative. But we're, we're concerned about a minimum. Okay, so what's the point of all this? Well, as I said, if I only look really close to this minimum, uh, then why don't we talk about this in sort of the way that we've been talking about small things this whole time um, and expand our uh, potential energy function around that point just using a Taylor series. So we know how to do that. This is just going to be the value at that point plus the derivative evaluated at that point plus, uh, oh, sorry, forgot a term here. So this is x minus x naught plus x minus x naught squared over 2 u double prime evaluated at x naught plus so on and so forth i'll call this order x minus x naught okay well we know immediately that this term vanishes right just by our definition of our um uh the definition of the minimum you know, the deriv the first derivative vanishes we know that this is greater than zero. And we also know that this first term is a constant. Uh, so this is just a number, right? So if I want to find the force which is acting on the object, I just have to take the derivative with respect to x. So uh, the force is going to be du dx, which I can approximate as well this first term as i said is a constant so it just drops out this term here is negative or is is zero just by the definition of our uh minimum and so the first term that actually survives is this one here where the only thing that the derivative sees is this x so this is um oops it should be minus um this is minus x minus x naught times u double prime x naught. And we know that u double prime is greater than zero. And so I'll rewrite this in a way which uh, is just minus k times x minus x naught, where I've just called k equal to u double prime x naught. But this is just the equation of a harmonic oscillator, right? A again, this is, uh, this is the equation that we've seen a million times for uh, a, a harmonic oscillator, also known as Hooke's Law. So again, we, we see how powerful these, uh, these Taylor series can be, where now we've made almost no assumptions about what our system has to be and we've seen that if it has a minimum, which is where the system is going to want to go to, as long as I'm only considering small little, so as long as I only hit the system a little bit away from the minimum, um, it's going to behave like a harmonic oscillator. I Now, granted, there, assuming there's no effects that, uh, so, I mean, in principle, you could have 
uh, we'll see, I'll just say assuming u double prime of x is not equal to zero, right? Because I, I mean, there could be some symmetry in my system or, or something weird like this, where this term also vanishes and I get a more complicated system. But for, for the most part, uh, for most systems, the, near a minimum, which like I said, is the ultimate goal of the system. The system wants to hit a minimum. Um, near that, it's just gonna behave like a harmonic oscillator. And so there's, there's a lot of truth to that joke. Um, so yeah, a, a, another pretty cool result we get from uh, just uh, looking at small numbers which might arise in our theory. So um, yeah. I'm gonna look at one more idea with this. Uh, this is a actually a cool one. But before I get to that, I'll uh, again take a moment, pause. Let everyone have a bit of a breather. Ask any questions they may have. Some water myself. Created. Um, back to it. Ah, what a great question. Um, so the, the question is, how do you define small? Uh, the scale here seems arbitrary. Uh, to just say small is whatever lets us do, uh, do this whole thing. Um, and that's a great question. And uh, I know you were at my last stream where I said you should always ask this question. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, and the whole idea is, um, yeah, I've, uh, in this case, assumed uh, that, okay, so, so the real answer is that I, uh, I've assumed here that these are dimensionless parameters, meaning that they're not like meters or centimeters or any of that. Because of course, you know, I, I could say, yeah, a centimeter is small. But then you can say, well, a millimeter is smaller. So how, how is that small? So on. Um, a, what's probably a better way of writing this, um, and this is actually what I'll do in the next, uh, next example, is, okay, say, say X has some dimensions. It, it's, uh, it has units to it. Uh, what I really should probably do is something like this, where I uh, maybe divide out x x naught, um, and so I'll say that x x naught times uh, x whoops x divided by x naught minus one times u prime x naught plus x naught squared times x divided by x naught minus one squared over two, so on. And my definition of small now is actually very clear. Uh, I know that x and x naught are always going to have the same dimensions, right? So if x is measured in centimeters, then x naught is measured in centimeters, right? Otherwise, I couldn't subtract the two from each other. It doesn't make sense to subtract um, something measured in seconds from something measured in you know, pascals. That doesn't make sense. Whenever I subtract two things, they have to have the same dimensions. But so now it makes a lot of sense to say, well, small means that this is small, is very small, right? So this is much, much less than one. Uh, so the ratio of these two parameters has to be very small, specifically the dimensionless um, ratio. That's what we really care about, are uh, dimensionless numbers being small. So in the previous example, um, we were able to do it with theta because uh, an angle is, is just automatically a dimensionless parameter. So um, it, it makes sense to say that a theta, that an angle is small because I mean really you're saying it's much smaller than 2 pi um, but so so yeah that that's a it's a fantastic question um, 
and uh i yeah i appreciate being called out on the sloppy notation <laughs> but yeah um if you do this all very formally you you should always make sure you know uh if you're saying something is small well what is it small compared to And actually, the, the next thing that I want to talk about uh, is a great example of, um, of uh, how to see that, or how that sort of idea comes up. Let's go ahead and uh, get into that. Um, so if you've been watching these streams or haven't, uh, something that we've done in the past is we've started writing down a theory of gravity um, just by considering conservation of angular momentum and Kepler's laws um, and all of this stuff. And uh, we've, just by considering that, uh, we've gotten pretty far uh, in writing down a gravitational force. And uh, so far, we found specifically the position dependence of gravity. So we called this some um, alpha magnitude of the distance. Um, so, so the idea being, if I have two objects, uh, right, uh, I can call some distance vector x between them and so the force is just going to be given by the inverse of the square of the magnitude of this position vector um, and it's always pointed in the opposite direction. Notice it doesn't really matter the direction that I um, draw this arrow because uh, Newton's third law, right? I would expect the force on this guy to be uh, equal in magnitude and in the opposite direction of the force on this guy. Okay, so I mean this is this is a, this is pretty good. We've gotten pretty far, but there there could still be other parameters of the system, um, which we're not encapsulating by just tying um, tying them up into this uh, number alpha. Um, we have the position dependence, which is great, but there might be other dependences that we're not to account. Okay, um, and so if, b before really getting into it, it's going to end up being a little more convenient to talk about the potential energy um, of this gravitational force, so the gravitational potential energy. Um, and we know that some change in potential energy is given by minus integral over some path dx dot f, um, which in this case, um, calling this r, uh, I can just write this as r squared in the r hat direction. Since everything's always happening radially, uh, I can just say that uh, this is going to be Keep in, in mind that the minus signs cancel. The integral from one radius to a second radius um, r alpha over r squared. And when I do this integral, I get something like minus alpha over r2 minus alpha over r1. Okay, now now looking at this, we notice, just to make sure that our ideas are all consistent, um, I'll write this as a note, that if r2 is greater than r1, um, then our change in potential energy is negative. This is less than zero. Right? Which means that if I, if I fall from some radius here down to some radius here, so call this R2, call this R1, then I've decreased my potential energy, which essentially just tells me that uh, gravity is always going to want to pull things together. Um, 
Right. So um, that's still consistent with what we were talking about before. I just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, is still still all good. Okay. So now, if if this is your first time seeing all of this this gravity stuff, uh, and you maybe took maybe you had this question the first time uh, you took a physics class or this is the first time seeing it you may be asking wait 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 hold on hold on uh up until this point you know uh, until we started talking about angular momentum and all this nonsense uh we always just use some constant gravitational force we always said that delta u is equal to minus mg h where h is the distance right if i if i drop some uh, I drop some ball from some height h um, we say that the change in potential energy is given by this well th this looks nothing like this so so what gives what what's what's going on here um, can't just pull the rug out from under me like that um, so how do we how do we reconcile this? We we have to have some way of making these two match up. Well, let's say that um let's look at this guy. And we'll say that we drop the ball from starting at some radius r1 equals r plus h and let it fall to some second radius which we'll just call r. Right, so so it um, in this case, this picture here, uh, this distance here is just given by h. Okay. So when I plug all this in, I get that my changing potential energy is now given by minus alpha times 1 over r minus 1 over r plus h and now I'm just going to factor out some overall factor of r minus alpha over r 1 minus 1 over 1 plus I'll call this epsilon where I've just defined epsilon as the ratio of h to r and now I'm going to be making Narf very happy because now I have some dimensionless uh, parameter which I can say is small. Right, h. h and r are both distances, so their ratio gives me something dimensionless. It, it, it doesn't have any units to it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm safe saying, uh, you know, epsilon much less than one this that statement now makes a whole lot of sense so let's let's go ahead and uh see what happens see let's let's look at what happens when uh this is small this ratio is small well to do that uh all i have to do is take the derivative of this guy so i mean if i say f of epsilon is equal to one over one plus epsilon, um, then f0 zero at 0 is equal to just 1. And then f1, uh, well, I'll just write out, write out what the derivative is. And this is just 1 plus epsilon squared, which then tells me f1 evaluated at 0 is equal to just minus 1. So I can approximate 1 plus epsilon as 1 minus epsilon. Just just to just to the the simplest order in epsilon. And so this tells me that my uh, delta u I can approximate as minus alpha over r 
times 1 minus 1 plus epsilon, um, which is just, I'll, I'll write out epsilon again, this, uh, minus alpha over r squared times h. Okay, so now we see the connection, because if we recall uh, what we were using before is delta u equals minus mg h. We now see that the, the only thing we're varying, which is h, right? h is the only thing that we're really allowing to change in this case, um, is linear in both of these terms, which means I can force these two things to agree. I, I, can, I can just make these two things agree because the, the actual um, variable in both of them is the same, so I can basically just fix this constant so that the two of these results match. Um, and so that just tells me that my alpha is equal to m r squared g. Now, uh, for the time being, I don't, I don't really care about this. this. This I'm not too concerned about, so I'm just going to define that as some other constant beta. Call this m times beta. The important thing is the mass. Right, so r I'm, I am technically fixing in this case, but r could be any, any number, g, I, who knows what g necessarily is. So I'll tie them together into some number beta. So now I'll rewrite my gravitational force. So force x. Well, I now know alpha is equal to minus beta over x squared acting in the x hat direction. But wait, this, this seems a little weird because this is, uh, this is asymmetric. Right, so uh, going back to our picture up here, maybe this is little m, and I'll call this big M. I've essentially pinned down big M. I've pinned down the, the big mass and let the little mass vary. But in principle, I, I should be able to do the same thing over here, right? Pin down this mass and let the big mass vary. And Newton's third law tells me that the force that the big mass feels should be exactly the same, just pointed in the opposite direction, as the mass that, uh, or as the force that the little mass feels. Right, so I should be able to, if I just write out the magnitude of this force, uh, I don't care about the direction necessarily. I know that this is m beta, I'll call this m beta 1 over x squared. So this is what uh, this little mass here feels. But I also know that the big mass should also feel um, a force that looks very similar, right? Just maybe a different beta. Right, I, I mean, I could, I could ignore that I ever did this whole thing for... Uh, little m and do it for big M instead, and I'd get the same result. But Newton's third law tells me that these two things have to be equal. Right? So m beta 1 over x squared has to be big M beta 2 over x squared. And so I can just solve this, and I get beta 1 over beta 2 is equal to big M over little m. Okay, so if beta 1 is proportional to big M and beta 2 is proportional to little m, we see that this all works out. So I might propose, well, and I will propose, and not alone in this, uh, as this is what Sir Isaac Newton proposed as well, um, that the gravitational force is given by some constant, which I'll call g sub n, times 
the two masses taking that live in the system uh, times this position dependence. Just do this. Um, and in this case, I might. I might suppose, yeah, maybe this is uh, actually a true constant. This is just, this here is just some number that doesn't change based on my system. Um, because now sort of all of the physical parameters that I might imagine are, are sort of taken up, right? I, I have the position dependence, I have the mass dependences of everything in my system. Um, so I, I, there's nothing that I can really think of as of right now that might... Uh, change this number from system to system. Now that doesn't say that it necessarily can't, but I'm going to suppose that it uh, is a true constant. So we'll say it's a constant of nature. It doesn't change. Um, and so now, just by doing this very simple thing with these Taylor expansions, right, just to sort of recap what we just did, we expanded our potential energy and we matched it up with the potential energy that we were using before, this constant force potential energy. Um, and just by doing that, we were able to find the mass dependence that we were missing uh, in our law of gravity. Um, and just to sort of uh, tie this into more modern physics terms, uh, this is this is done very frequently. This idea of matching, where uh, I might have some some theory where I'm sort of intentionally neglecting uh, some physics that I don't really care about. Right in this case, the uh, sort of long range physics of uh, Newtonian gravity of this this inverse square law of gravity. I, if I don't really care about that because I'm working on short changes in uh, distance. Um, then I can essentially match that onto some simpler theory just by essentially plugging in, uh, or by, by doing an expansion like this. And then I'll have a simpler theory that I can work with, like this MGH, where it still gives me good enough results, um... But I don't have to deal with all of the stupid complications that come with uh, the full inverse square law. And actually, I mean, as it, as it turns out, which, you know, it is probably not too surprising to people if I plug in, uh, so Newton's gravitational constant, say the mass of the Earth at sea level divided by the radius of the, or the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth at sea level, I get something which is about 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, so it all works out. It's all good. Um, and yeah. But also notice that if epsilon, and by epsilon I really am talking about h with respect to whatever radius I'm looking at, if that gets too large then this whole thing breaks down and I have to start looking at more and more terms. Um, and uh, what time? Uh, I probably have time to talk about that uh, a little bit more because there, there's a little more subtlety that goes into all of that. Um, but uh, so I, I think I might want to talk about that a little bit and then probably wrap up from there. But uh, yeah, so I'll uh, I'll pause real quick, see if there are questions. Then uh, go ahead and move on to sort of this last little extra, um, extra little topic, which is related. It's, uh, it's related, but not necessarily necessary for our understanding of all of this. But it, it's, I, I think it's interesting.
Okay. So. Okay, so as I was saying, um, when I when I have these corrections, yes, uh, as long as this what I called epsilon, this uh, h divided by r, is small, as long as that's pretty small, I can use this mgh. But when can't I? Uh, how high is too high? Uh, one might want to ask. And I mean, it's a it's a it's a good question, and uh, so let's let's approach it. So um, I can just write this out again: b m m over r times one minus one over one plus epsilon. And now, instead of expanding just to first order in epsilon, let's go another order in epsilon. And I I won't bore you by doing this explicitly. Um, but what you find is something like this, plus order epsilon cubed, or just something with the opposite sign, um, but higher order in, um, epsilon. Uh, and I'll just rewrite this in a different way, mgh, whoops, mgh. Plus, I'll call this mg prime h squared plus higher orders uh, over r cubed. Where now, uh, I what I call g prime is just um, g and m over r cubed, which is just our standard g divided by r where if i uh if i were to plug in so say this is the mass of the earth and the radius of the earth uh, at sea level this gives me something like 1.58 times 10 to the minus sixth uh inverse second so that's a really small number so that's um a bit a bit less than uh one one millionth um of an in second squared so um when when do these become relevant these terms become relevant um and I mean, what what we what we call relevant is obviously gonna depend on the situation. But uh, something that we might think, okay, this is this is gonna start uh, giving us a appreciable contribution, is when the order uh, order h squared terms. So these this second uh, order term, uh, we'll say it's you know roughly one tenth um the order h term right so so as i start cranking up h obviously this term here the second term is going to start getting bigger and bigger because of the square um whereas this first term started out big but it's not going to grow as fast so at some point this is gonna this second term here uh is going to be about one tenth uh, the first term. So we, I mean, we can just solve that. Mg prime h squared equals one tenth mgh, which then we can just solve for h. Um, and this mean, or this gives me something like h equals g over n g prime. Which, uh, if I just use this stuff here, this is going to be um, actually equal to uh, the radius of the Earth over n. So one tenth the radius of the Earth. Assuming I'm starting at the radius, like uh, assuming that I'm letting this thing fall to the radius of the Earth. If I go higher, then um, it'll. If I stop it higher up, then it'll be even higher. Uh, or to give this a little bit more perspective, 
Uh, so, uh, this is something like 637 kilometers, um, which is, which is very high. That's a very high number. So, so, uh, remember that this H is essentially the change in height. So I drop this thing from a height H above the ground. Um, and so this, this second order term isn't going to start, uh, um, contributing until you know i i get well okay in principle it always contributes but it'll give one tenth the contribution from this first order term uh at about 637 kilometers and to put that into perspective the international space station orbits uh at about 400 kilometers uh, so this is very high, and uh, obviously you're going to always be competing with air resistance effects and all this stuff, which are going to be come into play far, far uh, before these higher order terms come into play. So um, it actually turns out that this MGH is a very, very good approximate. Um, now, a, a one-tenth correction is actually pretty large. If you were to go to something like a... Um, one one hundredth that might be a little more satisfying for being a small contribution but um yeah so th this sort of uh might put it into perspective how how uh small this higher order contribution um okay and now just i just want to make one more point about this now say throughout all of this stuff um we didn't find an inverse square law. We found something else. So say say that we found we found that um, our potential energy is going to look something like I don't know some number e to the minus lambda r, where one over lambda is some it's some characteristic length. Uh, uh, of the system. So so the system just has some natural length associated with it which we'll call one over lambda um so now let's i mean we can do the same thing right so we can say look at delta u um equal to minus u dot e to the minus lambda big r minus e to the minus lambda r plus h um where we can again, uh, yeah, we can pull out a factor of um, r in all of this. Call this uh, h over r epsilon, all that good stuff, um, and then expand. I, I again, I, I won't bore you with the the exact details of all of this, and want to uh, expand about yourself. Pretty exercise, but anyway. Um, what I find is something like delta u is equal to minus not lambda h um, e to the minus lambda r. Uh, and actually, it, in this case, I expanded in lambda squared squared. Probably a little bit safer thing to expand in if I have some fixed characteristic length in my system. Again, th don't think of this as physical. This is just a sort of to prove a point. Um, where, again, we see something linear in H. So I might think, okay, well, if I say that mg is given by this combination of parameters um, in my system, I get something which is approximately g minus m g h there's nothing wrong with this this is uh this is all correct um I, I can do this i have these sort of free parameters in my theory that i might be able to fix um and when i do it this way i get the same result so here it's a it's a very interesting and very important point that when i'm doing this when i when i'm uh Looking at, in this particular case, the theory where my change in height is small, two completely different theories, so these theories you can see look nothing alike, 
uh, they give the same result. Uh, so I can always tell the, again in this particular case, I can always get the theory for small changes in height from, but not the other way around. So I can't, so I can't get a full theory theory of gravity from um, MGH, right? Because there, there could be tons and tons of different theories which reproduce MGH um, when considering small changes in height. So I, I can't choose one out of any of them. Now, something that I could do is I could consider larger changes in height, right? So in this particular case, if I expand out again, um, I get something like minus mgh plus mg lambda h squared over 2 uh, plus lambda cubed h cubed. So in this particular case, I get some uh, some different uh, quadratic term. So I might be able to see as I go out and it, uh, and do higher contributions, I might be able to see um, more of an effect show up there. But from the from the lowest effect, I I can't necessarily. Uh, see that and again I, I mean you might okay well who cares we only have one full theory of gravity so I mean who who cares about any of this and actually this whole thing becomes very relevant in uh, the so, um, the current state of the standard model so this comes up a lot when trying to find new physics beyond what we know of like the standard model uh, we think that the standard model is the first part in some expansion like this. But we can't know, we can't get any information of the full theory from just this first um, expansion. So it becomes very important to try to figure out if any of these uh, higher order terms do exist. Um, and figure out what they look like. And that's what a lot of experiments nowadays are trying to probe. So that's sort of the that's sort of the connection of all of this story with uh with what's actually being done in theoretical physics nowadays. Um so hopefully that's uh that's satisfying um for everyone uh all uh take any final questions you might have, but I, I, that's sort of all I wanted to talk about today. Um, take a moment, hang out for a bit, see if anybody has last questions. I, I mean, um, yeah, so the question is, how do we get to know the higher order terms? Just throw protons harder? That, that is one way. That is uh, certainly one way, is you just throw protons harder. I, I mean, um, so in, in this example that we did with gravity, uh, you get to see higher order terms from uh, longer distance. Uh, when you're talking about particle physics, uh, we accept we expect the opposite to be. Uh, we expect to see new physics arising at shorter distances. So if you're able to look at higher and higher energy, that actually corresponds smaller and smaller. So yeah, that's uh, a very valid way of uh, probing uh, or potentially probing. Physics is just throw protons harder. You can also. I think uh, nowadays people are really building like muon muon colliders or muon muon colliders. Um, 
which muons are fundamental particles, whereas protons are not. So protons have a whole bunch of structure that is um, much more complicated. But they're heavy, so protons are relatively heavy compared to protons. Um, so it's easier to get to higher energies with a proton, even if uh, uh, all of the stuff inside of the proton actually participates in the action. Um, whereas a muon is much heavier than an electron as well, but it's fundamental. So if I hit, if I have a muon hitting a muon, um, hit muon, then uh, I'll be able to get much more efficient conversion of energy. From that but there's i mean there's also other um other experiments as well you might be able to look at the um muon g minus two or the anomalous magnetic moment of a muon so on and so forth um but yeah i i mean there, there's lots of different ways of probing this uh new physics uh or these these new physics scales so Yeah, the, the answer is throwing protons harder is certainly one way of doing it, but there's a lot of different uh, ways, and that's sort of um, a big push in modern experimental physics to find these new ways that don't necessarily involve spending billions of dollars on a you know bigger CERN. Oh, um, okay, so, okay, so I have another question. Are these higher order terms in gravity what results in the precession of Mercury in the Schwarzschild solution? So that's taking this whole story one step further, right? Um, so we see that uh, in Newtonian gravity, when we look at um, the very non extreme cases, right um we see this mgh now there's one step beyond newtonian gravity which is general relativity and general relativity is a much more complicated theory than newtonian gravity very different very different interpretation physically all of this stuff um but it turns out that it very similar to this so it's very first uh term when i consider certain parameters relations of parameters its first term tends to be gmm over r squared or gmm over r if i'm looking at the potential and then i get corrections from that and these corrections are what give me the uh things like precession of mercury all of this stuff um but yes you're 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 exactly right. I, I don't know if this is what you were uh, asking about specifically GR, if, you're, if you were asking about Newtonian gravity, but the point is you don't see that in Newtonian gravity. You don't see, um, well, when you take into account the or, or the gravitational pull from other planets and all this stuff, you do get a precession, but it's not the correct precession. It's off by, I think, like 43 arc seconds per century or something like that so very small but if i take into account these extra terms um from gr that go even beyond what newtonian theory does then i i i get extra uh precession i i get this uh so for for those that don't know um the idea is that okay well in newtonian gravity I find that things just go around, uh, they orbit in an ellipse. But what we see um, is not quite that, specifically with Mercury. 
very close to the sun, so very good at probing um, uh, more extreme gravitational uh, physics. So what you see in Mercury is instead of traveling in a ellipse, it does something like this. Where um, we say it processes about, uh, or the, the, well, the perihelion uh, processes. So it does something like this, um, which is, is not a prediction of uh, Newtonian gravity. So you might ask, okay, well, what the heck is going on? And it turns out exactly what uh, Narf was saying is uh, when, when I look at higher order corrections of this from general relativity, now, general relativity is a very difficult thing to solve, so this is a very useful exercise, uh, or very useful idea to do. Um, I find exactly this, and it exactly makes up for that 43 uh, seconds of arc um, that is not accounted for in Newtonian gravity. So... Um, yeah, so so that's that's exactly uh, what happens. Is uh, as I was saying, there's a one over r cube term that shows up, and and that's exactly what it is. Is um, I have you know it's some number which might depend on masses, uh, one over r cubed. Dot, dot, dot. So you can see that it at long distances, this term here is going to be very very small. But once I get to shorter distances, it's it's going to become relevant. That's exactly the case. And, you know, uh, the same way as we've been talking this whole time, there's an infinite number of these terms because it's expansion. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, great questions. Great questions. Okay, uh, I think... Uh, I think I might wrap it up here. Uh, going on about uh, two hours now, I think. So I, this is probably a good place to call it for the evening. So I uh, just want to take a moment and thanks, thank everyone for showing up, asking questions. Um, and all of that. So... With that, uh, bye everyone. Oh, okay.